So hi everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us for the University of Sydney's Department of Gender and Cultural Studies seminar today. I hope you're staying safe and relatively sane during these challenging times. I'm speaking to you from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and I invite you to do um, the same for the lands and peoples where you are in the Zoom chat. So today we are very lucky to be able to share a seminar with you from two extremely esteemed and important contributors to the field, um, Professor Megan Morris and Professor John Froe. Um, they are speaking on the topic of writing cultural studies as a part of this semester's seminar series program on writing as method. My name is Vivian Nara, a final year PhD in the department, and I'll be chairing the session today. The seminar will be run as follows run as follows. Each presenter will speak for about 50, um, 30 minutes, sorry, that's 30 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of questions, with Professor Morris speaking first, followed by Professor Fro. After each presentation, I will open up the floor to questions. If you would like to ask a question, please um, leave a letter Q in the chat or use the raise hand function. I'll keep Thank my you. eye... Oh. Oh, sorry, I'll just keep going. Um, I'll keep my eye out on the chat box for the order of questions. So uh, I might just, oh, a bit of noise. Okay, um, our first speaker today is Professor Megan Morris. Absolutely no stranger to the vital day-to-day -day life of our department. Um, I'm sure many of us are warmly familiar with Professor Morris's influence and mentorship, um, which is felt in Australia and abroad. The remarkable reach of Professor Morris's work can quickly be sensed in a survey of her books. The Pirate's Fiance, Feminism Reading Postmodernism, published in 1988. Too Soon, Too Late, History in Popular Culture, published in 1998. And Identity Anecdotes, Translation and Media Culture, published in 2006. Having just finished co-editing a book around the film Showgirls with Melissa Hardy and Kane Race, Professor Morris is currently co-authoring a book on Hong Kong Kung Fu cinema since 1997 with Stephen Chan Ching Kyu. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Morris. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. <laughs> uh, I'm going to jump right in and share my screen. I hope. No. Why is that not? Ah, there we go. Is that right? Can you see? Good. Let's blow this up. Oh. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I do two kinds of writing cultural studies. And I've decided that the one I'm going to talk to you about today is absolutely not feasible if you're in full-time academic employment. But it also happens to be the mode of writing that is responsible for most of my major essays, which some of the younger people here might have been forced to read in various classes. So I thought the only interesting thing to do is to tell the truth about how um, I write that sort of cultural studies. Um, but if this was an exercise video, I would say, do not try this at home. But I think I'll just say and said, do not do this if you're trying to write a PhD. Okay. Um, there are two driving principles in, in all writing for me. And the first of them is sound in my head, inner, inner sound. I had a very solitary childhood in a town, a country town where I was extremely unhappy. And interestingly, yesterday when I was trying to look for a picture of Tenderfield online, I came across these quotes which claim to be from yesterday. Um, well, sorry, uh, on a real estate agent's 
website and the real estate agent is trying to say this is such a pretty picturesque town it's just really beautiful and these local people keep coming in to say it's a horrible town and if you have children do not move here the schools have gangs who bully anyone new and of course anyone new in a town where uh, people pride themselves on never having left the shire um, being new can go back 30 or 40 years of residency in the town. I Ethically, I must say immediately, this is my experience, it's by no means everybody. Um, while it's true, there's a great deal of racism in this, as in most old country towns, it's also, Tenterfield is also a town which has produced very creative Indigenous uh, leaders and artists like Bronwyn Bancroft and <clears throat> Gary Foley, who was a year ahead of me at school, and I just remember he was great at high jumping. Uh, so I'm not here to talk to you about Tenderfield. What I am here to talk about is the effect of isolation and um, loneliness on a child in the 1950s. Now, this photo, I'm not a child, I'm about 25. I've come back from uh, Paris, you can tell, because French hairdressers can't bear white women with curly hair and they make you straighten it. And I'm in the bush with my dad, who was a forester. My dad was also a bushman, a real bushman. You can tell he was a real bushman because he's letting me smoke. Um, amongst a whole pile of dry leaves. It's clearly winter, but it's very dry. My dad would know what to do if the slightest spark flew sideways. I have a coy daddy's girl look on my face, not only because I love my father very much and I hadn't seen him for the two years I was studying in France, but because he was taking me to the bush. He didn't do this when I was a child, when all the other kids would go swimming in water holes and all those idyllic things of the 1950s. My dad would say, Love, I spend the whole week in the bush. I just want to sit in a chair and read books. So I didn't get to go out with him. What I did instead was create a newspaper, among other things. Elspeth may enjoy this. I invented in my lonely solitude where the only sounds were inside my head, a world, a city of sea creatures. And I invented a newspaper called the Shell Town Gazette. I illustrated it, populated it with characters, um, created scandals, headline news, and I sold it to my parents for two shillings a copy, and I made them buy one each. I hated the bush. I remember kicking trees one day and saying, I wish you could talk. I wish you could talk. What do I do with a story like that? Now, I'm afraid I might not actually get to cultural studies, so uh, I'm going to borrow a model from Larry Grossberg who wrote something about my writing once when I could never say what my method was and he said well I'm going to tell you what it is. Um, it's about combining the historical context, remembering that context is something you create when you periodize, uh, carve it off from other things, a political question out of the now and a theoretical problem. If I was to go back to that moment that I just talked to you about, this is probably what I would do. My political problem would be to do with death, death and rural towns and terrible health care. This is something I've been angry about for 20 or 30 years. Uh, my father died when he did because of bad hospital care. Look at what's happened in Wilcannia, the way Indigenous peoples pleased for preparation 
were ignored until it's too late. That would be my problem. Um, to situate it in a history that I have some involvement in, would probably begin with one of the greatest works ever of Australian cultural studies, Katrina Schlunker's book, Bluff Rock, Autobiography of a Massacre. Uh, Bluff Rock is just outside Tintfield. Um, lots of people agree it's a very bad place. I've seen it described just as bad juju. Um, there was a massacre of Aboriginal people there in the 1840s. Um, and what Katrina's book does is try to explore what we too easily call silence in history and in competing historical accounts. Uh, and she unpacks when it's not actually silence that's involved with particular ways of particular people knowing things and saying or not saying. And I would bring this back to the problem of thought. And my theoretical problem would be the concept of inner speech, what goes on in your mind. I, I talked earlier about inner sound, but inner speech is more than that. It's a heterogeneous mix of images and sensations and feelings. In one of my favorite diagrams from Ferdinand de Saussure, He's trying to disengage the concept of the sign. And plane A is what he called the plane of vague amorphous thought. And I think for me, that's where writing begins. But plane B is the featureless plane of sound. And his theories of the sign are about trying to work out how these things are sutured. Uh, together. But there are theories of what goes on in this plane, that one too, but the plane of thought. I would, if I were writing a cultural studies essay, which I'm not going to do, I would go back to Saussure. I would look at the great theorist of inner speech, Lev Vygotsky, a Soviet psychologist, and then Paul Willeman and Kara Keeling, who more recently... <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> uh, okay. Someone's not <laughs> muted, I think. Um, I would look at Paul Willeman and Kara Keeling, who've applied this to the cinema and trying to understand what actually happens in the cinema uh, when we understand a film. From Shell Town Gazette to the Sydney Morning Herald and my second big principle in writing, which is the shape of a sentence, the look, the visual appearance uh, of writing. I worked for the Herald and various other newspapers for quite a few years when I was in my thirties. And it's really hard work, but not the way I imagine. Hard work is posing for photographs like this, uh, which appeared in Poll magazine. Um, and you have to do it because it's part of your job doing the promotion. I also like this photo. But what I want you to look at is the look of these paragraphs. That's how you had to write in those days for a newspaper column. You probably still do today. And it marked me profoundly. Like day after day for years, I would have to write pretty much the same shape and size of sentence in order to produce a string of prose. To this day, I cannot bear ragged paragraphs. I can't stand paragraphs that spill over the page as if any of my ex-PhD students are here, they'll know I say, if it goes over the page, it's too long. You have to be more succinct. But it's, it's an absolute compulsion for me to make my sentences look neat when I'm writing. And it's the mark of years of labor. Now, the next thing I would do if I'm doing a cultural studies thing is, is I thicken that inner speech, that thing I can't tell people. The worst question is, what are you working on? 
I mean, I've long ago learned to make up some nonsense, but if I could tell you, I would have finished writing it. Um, I read as much as I can. I Google, I dream, I take hands. I used to take handwritten notes. These days I use post-it notes. And if when I can't go back, I forget why I have that post there, I throw it away. So it's like sifting mulch. You create mulch and you sift it. Um, and then this is not research in a methodical way. I've never in my life begun with a database or compiling a bibliography. Uh, I follow interesting footnotes and I follow URLs. And sooner or later, you end up with nausea. You've read too much. It's just like a kind of... Ugh. And then writing an article has to begin. And that's when out of this mulch comes a question, a writing question. And th this is the most recent thing I completed, an essay for Kane and Melissa on showgirls. Um, and what came up out of everything are these three quotes from Baudelaire, Eve Sedgwick, and an Eartha Kitt song. And my writing question is why? are they connected? What is the connection? And I have to believe very profoundly that there is a connection, that I'm not just you know, bullshitting or being cute. I could tell you what the initial sets of links were. Uh, I didn't know why I wanted to think about evil in relation to the film show girls except that the director had said it could be called uh, All About Evil. Um, and uh, I read a critique of the idea that uh, the theory of the double, this is my theoretical section, which has always been connected um, with evil, had degenerated from this period of high romantic literature through to the kitsch of modern popular culture. Uh, I can't go into any more than that, except to say I didn't know at the beginning any more than you do now what the connection was. But that's when working to make the connection uh, really starts. If you feel profoundly sure that there's a connection, it is my superstitious belief, the world, if you're working hard enough, will give you, give you evidence. And you must have evidence. You have to motivate what otherwise appears as a set of arbitrary or overcute associations. And my motivation came from discovering Eartha Kitt's autobiographies. Now, on the left-hand side is an early shot uh, of the film Showgirls with Nomi walking out with a suitcase to hitchhike. On the right is the pulp paperback cover of Eartha Kitt's first autobiography in 1956 um, of her journey from the south to the north. Is that a, a sound warning? Okay, um, her journey north, uh, where she became a, a global superstar. Uh, at the end of this book, she arrives in Las Vegas with her name on um, a big, you know, advertising billboard. So I think, oh my God, this is about it. This is a connection. It's something about what we don't say about the links between different kinds of women who worked in the cultural industries in the transformative period in the mid 20th century. Next principle, talk to your friends. Melissa Hardy gave me the most wonderful gift of research validation by reminding me that Cindy Sherman took a picture of a woman with a suitcase on the side of the road as an untitled film still in 1979. And that's why I say, this is really a thing. There is something here. I have to trace the meaning of this figure. 
I'm almost finished. So next, there's all that stuff, there's belief, there's motivation, there's evidence. So I make a plan and then I make another plan and then I plan again and then I ignore the plan. Uh, I have trouble with plans. You can see why, because the way I think is all in the arrows. Um, people who, who can plan with bullet points are a total mystery to me, but nevertheless is a vital step because the inner speech remembers what some of the main intellectual infrastructure might be. Then finally, last slide, I get to the computer. And that's when sound and shape take over. Now, these are three examples from two days work where there's only another 10 examples. I haven't finished this essay. I can't get ahead. I can't keep going any further till I solve the shape of the sentence and the sound. And I'll just explain one decision here. This is oriented towards precision in the mind of someone who's seen the film I'm talking about. Raymond Chow drops by to pick up a takeaway for dinner with his wife. I just don't like it. The sound is wrong. The rhythm is bad. And then I realise, hang on, someone who hasn't seen the film needs to know Raymond Chow drops by as himself to pick up a takeaway dinner. I get a different kind of precision, but I also get a sound that works. This is how I actually write cultural studies. Um, I'm not sure there's anything anybody but me can do about it, but it explains to you why I am very slow, why I have written very few books. And in the 15 years or so, I was a full-time academic. I did not do this at all. I used my skills from the Shelltown visit to knock off referee journal articles quickly. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Our second speaker for today is Professor um, John Froh, also a long-standing figure at the University of Sydney and beyond. Um, and in cultural studies and beyond. <laughs> I'm sure some of us will warmly remember um, Professor Fro as a frequent visitor to um, our department seminars over the years. Um, Professor Fro is recently retired from the university. His work oscillates between literary and cultural studies and his last book was on interpretive conflict um, published with the University of Chicago Press in 2019. Uh, Professor Fro is currently working on a project on the economic value of intangibles and singularities. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Fro. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Vivian, and um, thank you, Megan, for that illuminating talk. Um, let me start by picking up on the, the notion of paragraphs. Um, I want to start by talking about. Um, uh, the American novelist, Don DeLillo. What I wanted to do was show you a letter that I have from DeLillo to me, politely turning down an invitation to talk in Australia. Um, it's, um, I wasn't able to do that because it, it was amongst all the stuff that got thrown out of my office when I left the university. Um, why I value it um, is that it bears the marks of DeLillo's eccentric typewriter with some of the letters imperfectly formed, some of them blotching the ink onto the page. And it, it tells me something about how DeLillo writes. But what I know about DeLillo is that he has a peculiar method of composition. He types one paragraph on one page. Um, so the paragraph sits there surrounded by white space and then he sits and stares at it and retypes it and retypes it um, until he gets it right. Nietzsche says that our writing tools are also working on our thoughts. DeLillo's key writing tool is his typewriter, or was. I imagine he might have graduated to a computer by now, um, together with um, a particular use of the page that allows him to compose paragraph by paragraph, working out the viability, the rhythms and connections of the sentences within the paragraph, and then leaving as a secondary matter, the 
the connections between paragraphs in a larger narrative. So that's how, how Delillo thinks his texts, how he gives them a shape that isn't a representation of anything that precedes it. Part of the post-structuralist critique of the Western philosophical tradition, I'm talking, of course, about Derrida here, is that philosophy from Plato onwards has radically separated thinking from writing. In that tradition, thought is imagined to take place in the mind and then to be transposed or expressed directly through the breath, the spirit, the spoken word, with writing then a mere secondary imitation of speech. But Derrida or Rorty would argue that speech is already organized by systems of difference, the kind of systems of which writing is one exemplar. Um, philosophy is writing, either in the form of organization of its expression or as a matter of fact. We read Socrates' words because Plato has written them down. Or more precisely, Plato has written dramatic dialogues which claim to be representations of a prior speech which the writing itself invents. Thought, I want to say, is shaped by writing in its most material dimensions. Writing is perhaps an intensifier of thought, or it's productive of thinking. Organized thought, at least in cultures that are no longer primarily oral, is shaped by writing. The English word writing is a gerund, a noun formed from the continuous form of the verb. I am writing, the present participle. Um, um, uh, writing is both an achieved task then, the thing written, but also always um, processual, at least as English understands the word. Um, in English, it, it can be contrasted with scripture, the fixity of writing the written word. Whereas the etymological equivalent of scripture in French, écriture, is given the active processual sense of the English gerund by Bart and um, others of the um, that generation of the 60s, the Telkel people. So the English gerund writing carries the sense of incompletion. The writing that I present to you to read is nevertheless still going on. Writing is a kind of thinking and it's never finished. It's only ever abandoned at the point where I can't think with it anymore or where the law of diminishing returns sets in. Um, that's about as theoretical as I'm gonna get in this paper. Um, because it's so central a part of my life, I'm constantly fascinated with how other people write. And I love seeing Megan's notes, which are even messier than mine. So I'm fascinated with um, all of the machinery of writing, all the preparatory work, the revision and so on. Did Heidegger use a typewriter? Did Foucault co compose on a computer? We know that Dostoevsky wrote some of his novels in a one room apartment with the noise and turmoil of his rather large family all around him. Uh, Ngugi Wationgo wrote the first draft of his first novel on toilet paper in a Kenyan prison because he was refused um, writing paper. Most tragically, Mikhail Bakhtin in a Siberian prison used the, the unique manuscript of his book on the epistolary novel as rolling paper for cigarettes. There's now an extensive literature on the materiality of writing. Much of it centers on deposits in the physical archive where texts exist in various states of completion. There's a scholarly fascination with the draft with the crossings out and the discarded pages that signal the processual nature of writing, or with the marginalia signifying how writers think as they read. There's that whole visibility of the process of revision, of rethinking and reshaping that you get from seeing a writer's manuscript. Um, there's a growing literature too on the relationship between literary modernism and various kinds of technology, much of it inspired by the German scholar Friedrich Kittler, um, who writes about the affordances made um, available by film, by the gramophone, by the typewriter. As with McLuhan, there's a kind of technological determinism there, which nevertheless has considerable power in helping us think about how technologies of writing get us composing differently. Think of Henry James dictating his late novels to a secretary who was using shorthand so that those novels catch the elaborate, the ever more elaborate 
rhythms of, of his thinking out loud. Think of James Joyce writing Finnegan's Wake, surrounded by dozens of dictionaries that his half-blind eyes could barely read. Think of Hemingway writing his journalism with a typewriter, but his stories and novels with a pen. So a very different kind of um, labor in his imagination, um, where the touch of the fingers on a kind of stick rather than on the keyboards gives a different shape to the way he thinks the words that come from it. Um, um, allowing him to think through the changeable shape of the letters that he writes uh, um, as opposed to the print-like form of typewriting. For an earlier period, we have detailed scholarship on the procession of manuscripts from foul papers through to printed texts and detailed information on the vagaries of individual printers in the composition of the printed papers that make up a book. Similarly, we know a lot about how early modern writers made use of commonplace books um, where they put down transcriptions from their reading together with scraps of observation and thinking. Um, the commonplace book is where reading starts to become writing, becomes the raw material of, of more writing. Most writers that I know make their way through the world with a notebook um, where they write down um, thoughts on the wing, trying to catch the those raw materials that will be, then become something else. But that catching of thought removes a singular thought from the flow of thinking in which it occurs. Socrates complained that writing destroys memory by separating it, separating it from the person. Writing is a fixing of thought, but thought is thereby removed into an impersonal space where it loses its initial context of enunciation and loses too its contact with the listener who gives feedback who argues back, who changes the course of my discourse. Relying on this trans transposition of thought into the fix fixity of writing, my memory becomes less active, less able to keep open the archives on which it draws. Writing, of course, requires literacy, a long training, both in the recognition and manipulation of letters and in the ways of thinking that accompany reading and writing. And literacy is unequally distributed within and between populations, it's a privileged asset. The kind of writing that we do as academics is an extension of the essays we were tra trained to write as students, how however far we might diverge or think we might diverge from those generic norms. So now let me make a confession. I loathe writing, I loathe the business of writing. It feels to me like the worst kind of drudgery and I use endless stratagems to put off the moment when I have to sit down and actually put pen to paper or touch the keyboard. When I do sit down, I take constant breaks. I find other things to do. And when I do sit down to write, I find myself constantly erasing what I've done. Um, I suffer acutely from writer's block um, with everything I write. Um, on my current project, which I, like Megan, I make up a little description about what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. Um, I say I'm writing about the, the economic value of singularities and what intangibles. I've got no idea what this project is, but I've been working on it for two years. I'm completely blocked. All I can do is read and read and read, take ever more notes and get ever further away from that moment when I have to start making sense of all this stuff. Um, how do other people write? Many writers of fiction use writing software that allows them to keep track of characters and plot. For academic writing, a key problem is the relationship between source materials derived from some archive and the text that's being written. Some academics use a system of cards on which they write quotations or short bits of argument. Those cards are then numbered or sorted according to some classification system that makes sense to the writer, but usually no one else. My dream is someday to write a book without footnotes, without the need for those archival materials, summarizing complex arguments and large bodies of source materials without ever having to cite them directly, um, without ever being bound to the conventions of referencing my sources. But how I actually write is something else. What I do, um, this is the mechanical descriptive part, is I start with the notes that I've taken in the course of my reading towards the stuff I'm writing. 
I used a long time ago, I used to take notes in longhand um, with transcriptions of quotations onto the right hand uh, page, the recto of A4 notebooks and free floating thoughts on the verso of the previous page. So on the left hand side, I'd have these free floating annotations with no necessary relationship between the contents of the recto and the verso. Now I either copy and paste quotations from the PDF in which I read them, or I use voice recognition software to dictate them directly from a book, or occasionally I type them out. Um, the logic of the selection of quotations that I make as I read already implies a, a preliminary kind of thinking about the argument I want to make, although at this stage that argument is very general and tentative. At some point I start making, just like Megan, I make endless plans of the argument I want to make, um, and finally those plans take the form of numbered points. And like Megan, um, I um, make numerous plans and ignore them completely as I, I write. What I do then is I photo, this is a dreadful process and please uh, any postgraduate um, listening should uh, not be tempted to do as I do. What I do is I photocopy all my notes, usually hundreds of pages of them. I cut up the pages in accordance with those numbered lists in my plan. Um, then I spread them out in piles on the floor, and then I organize them into sub piles, which are then internally sorted, often with a logic that evolves as I do the sorting. Then I staple these sheets of collocated notes into a continuous run of pages, um, which I number, and which I usually photocopy again so that I don't get staples sticking into my hand. Um, so these pages that I eventually come up with are the raw material of my writing. At that point, when I can no longer defer it, I get to um, sitting at my desk and start trying to transform, transform those raw materials into some coherent form on my computer. But transforming is too serious a word for the messy process by which I ignore some of my notes, or most of them, shuffle everything around, try to make sense of the logic of the ordering of my notes, and then finally get a computer draft that in turn goes through a process of shuffling and shifting until I produce something I can bear to read. And even my finished drafts are never finished until the moment I send them off as an attachment. So let me, let me try and um, um, share a document to the screen. This may not happen, but let's see how it goes. Whoops. Um, Um, no. It... Are you are you using the share screen button at the bottom yeah, of the? Yeah, I'm doing it, but I can't get to what I want. Look, uh, um, let me not worry about it. I'll I'll read this. I'll read. It's just a um, a couple of um, short paragraphs from the beginning of an essay on iconoclasm in my last book on interpretive conflict. So I begin with. Um, 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 a quotation from um, uh, the novelist Michael Ondaatje. Let me just find it. Um, so the quotation is is this. Um, uh, sorry, it'd be easier if I put this up on my own screen. Sorry about this. Um, it's from a novel called Anil's Ghost, a very wonderful novel about. Um, uh, an archaeologist, a forensic archaeologist working um, uh, in Sri Lanka during the, I think, the 1990s. Uh, and it's all about the, um, the death squads, the um, men in white vans who disappear people. But he's talking here about um, statues of the Buddha and the way they're created. He says, a special artist is needed to paint the eyes on a holy figure. It's always the last thing done. It's what gives the image life. The artificer puts the brush over his shoulder and paints in the eyes without looking directly at the face. He uses just the reflection to guide him. So only the mirror receives the direct image of the glance being created. No human eye can meet the Buddhas during the process of creation. Um, and then my, my own text starts like this. 
In pictures of the human or divine face, it's above all through the eyes that the soul seems most clearly to shine forth. Iconoclastic attacks on images or sculptures frequently seek to erase the eyes. And WJT Mitchell tells of a colleague who persuades his disbelieving students of the magical relation between an image and what it represents by asking them to take a photograph of their mother and cut the eyes out. The notion of a magical relation here desig designates not a conventionally constructed likeness, but an identity or fusion between an image and what it designates. The picture is in some sense infused with the being of the God or the saint or the person um, it pictures. Okay, so I'm sorry, I, I can't uh, work out how to show you that text. Um, let me just talk briefly about, about um, what I think happened with there. I started a very long time ago with the Ondaatje quote, quotation um, uh, about the way the Buddha is, is painted in such a way that the artist do, does, doesn't look the Buddha in the eye. He paints in a mirror, reaching backwards to paint the eye in. Um, so that was one quotation I wanted to use. The other is that wonderful story that Tom Mitchell tells, tells about um, the teacher who tells his graduate students to cut the eyes out of a picture of their mother in order to make the point about the sacred force of images. And I use that then to um, begin an argument about the logic of iconoclasm, a logic, the force of which is such that it can only be explained by a kind of perverse belief that um, the image of the God or the saint or the person is inhabited by a kind of demonic presence. Um, each of those sentences of mine was reshaped in order to get, I mean, the, particularly the, the first one, um, 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 uh, um, sorry, I, I won't try and reconstruct the way those sentences were reshaped, but I can tell you that it took me days and days to get those couple of sentences right. Um, my rhetorical aim was, was to get straight into something quite forceful, um, particularly um, by telling the Mitchell story in such a way as to, to provoke a kind of double take by its terse concision, not explaining what was so horrible about using the image of the mother's eyes being cut out, just using it to hopefully shock um, a reader and initiate a difficult argument about the power of images, which I then follow through a more conventional history of iconoclasm in order later on to get to an account of the relation between the art museum and the destruction of images. So the logic by which an, ar an argument is constructed is always, at least for me, difficult um, because multiple lines of argument are always possible at any one point, and that multiplicity is exacerbated as, ex as it extends exponentially, a word we've all come to know and love, over a long span of writing. Writing involves both this struggle to force a um, coherent argument out of pro proliferating materials and the rhetorical task of putting yourself um, in the place of a reader, asking what they will understand from the threads of argument you give them, since the interlocutor, interlocutor I might have in speech is absent when I'm writing. There's always the question then of what other text, this text that I'm writing might, might be, what pathways it chooses not to explore with what alternative arguments, which are always branching out from this one, always potentially superior to it. I'm always shadowing this text with um, um, absent potential, uh, pot potentialities. Although I started writing with a pen, indeed, when I was a child, I learned to write with a nib pen dipped into an inkwell um, um, and then moved on to a ballpoint pen and its various later incarnations. I now, of course, write on and with and through a computer. Um, there are interesting questions, I think, about how um, computation has changed writing. Um, especially the process of rewriting, of revision, of rethinking. It's clearly much less cumbersome um, to do all that editorial work, all that work of revision um, on a computer when you can move sentences around freely, when you don't have to white out sentences or start, a new, start typing a page all over again. Um, there's no need to keep the flow of a sentence in your head 
you can try out variants, see how different rhythms work. There's no economizing on paper or parchment. Um, that simplicity of erasure and revision bears, I guess, a, a genealogical relationship to the palimpsest, the manuscript uh, where one layer of writing is scraped out in order for another layer to go over the top. But those techniques of overwriting are now made almost uh, immaterial. Um, and of course, the computer opens up a range of other possibilities of textualization, the incorporation of images or of sound, of graphs or pictures or of video. Um, the computer is both a writing tool and a tool of connection to the world. The kind of, of writing, uh, because we can always wander off um, uh, into the, um, the vastness of the internet, we can always divert ourselves from the computer as, as text processor into the computer as, as uh, um, um, hyperlink explorer. Um, the computer is both a writing tool and a tool, a tool of connection. The kinds of writing I've been describing um, are not connected, they're very solitary. Um, and they are somewhat anomalous in the world of academic work where most writing is collective. Collective. Oh, Sorry to interrupt. I just want to let you know there's uh, maybe um, five minutes left would be good. <laughs> just okay. letting you know. Thanks, Thanks Vivian. Um, um, so I might, I might stop there actually um, with the, um, um, I was going to talk about the text that I've co-written with um, Tony Bennett, hi Tony, uh, and with Megan a very long time ago which involve difficult problems of, of getting a unity of voice throughout a disparate text, of imagining yourself into the other person's style, um, of working out what they might or might not tolerate from you. Um, um, we think of our writing as being solitary, but of course it's not. Um, we constantly work with materials that we derive from other people and then incorporate thread into our own arguments. Um, we share our texts with other people. Our texts go out into the world where they stop being uh, our texts. Um, um, writing is endlessly fascinating, um, in part because of that complexity of connections that it opens out. Thanks.